A common complaint I hear from commenters on my mini PC videos is that they're too mini, that they sacrifice too much in the way of thermals and therefore performance in pursuit of being as small as possible. In that regard, I think Minus Forum's doing it right, and their NAB9 seems to strike the right balance. Not so big as to be disqualified from the mini PC category, but not so small as to be unable to dissipate enough heat. Of course, as it's powered by a 12th gen Intel i9, it'll have its work cut out. At a bare-bones price of £369, and with options bringing it to a maximum of £519, the NAB9 that Minus Forum supplied for this review is a well-specced mini PC for general purpose computing, but one that's built to fit within that relatively low price point. It's powered by a 12th gen Intel i9-12900H, a CPU I've tested on the channel before, quite recently in fact, Actually, it's the HK version, which is the same chip with an unlocked multiplier, but both the BIOS and XTU lack any multiplier control, so to all intents and purposes, this is basically the H version. While it's a perfectly decent performer for a chip with 6 P cores and 8 E cores, with some Iris XE graphics that are a step up from the UHD graphics of the past, I've found that it can easily overwhelm a smaller thermal solution. What sets this mini PC apart from some of the competing units I've tested is that Minus Forum don't seem against adding a few millimetres to the chassis if the result is going to be a better overall product. The NAB9 is by no means husky, but it's a little thicker and with a slightly larger footprint than other recent examples, allowing for a bigger heatsink and without compromising on connectivity. The NAB9 does a decent job here, though it's not going to satisfy everyone. On the front, it has a pair of USB 3.2 Type-A ports and a 3.2 Type-C for data, as well as the obligatory headphone jack. The Type-C doesn't support display output, however, that doesn't mean the NAB9 is lacking. On the rear, it has a pair of HDMI 2 ports, as well as two more Type-Cs. One supports display only, while the other supports data, power delivery and display. Sadly, neither port supports USB 4 or Thunderbolt, so that rules out any easy eGPU options, but if external graphics are your bag, then I'm sure you won't let a thing like that stop you. Rounding out the port selection is a couple more 3.2 Type A's, a barrel jack for power, and the headline feature for some viewers, dual 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. One of my favourite features is the easy, toolless access to upgrades. The top panel opens with a single press, revealing the vacant 2.5 inch drive bay for those who want to add some cheap mass storage and turn this into a mini NAS. Unfortunately, that's about it for mass storage, as you only have a single M.2 slot option for NVMe drives, though again, you DIY eGPU folks should have enough options here to get creative. The only other user accessible upgrades are the DDR4 SODIMM slots, which in my case came populated with a pair of 16GB 3200 sticks for a total of 32GB, as well as the Wi-Fi adapter. Considering the aforementioned chunkiness of the NAB9, this doesn't seem like a huge amount of upgradability, but this is because the majority of this extra space is taken up by the heatsink. Short of Chewy's Corebox series, this is one of the bigger thermal solutions I've seen in a mini PC so far, with plenty of ventilation grills on the bottom, sides and rear to allow air to pass through. From what I've seen of the i9-12900H, it's gonna need it. Starting as usual with CPU-Z to test thermal throttling behaviour, and this is a really encouraging start. The initial multi-core results start over 6900 and stay there till about run number 7. The last PC I tested with this CPU scored less than that even at full throttle, so I'd say this is a hell of a result. That trend continues in Cinebench R23. As always, this is the 10 minute looping render test that often causes mobile Intel CPUs to fall down. I'm not going to say this is flawless, 
The first run scored exactly 15k, which would be an incredible result, but by the end of the 10 minutes, that had fallen to under 12.5k. This is still pretty marvellous for a mini PC. The last 12900H I tested lost over half its performance during those 10 minutes, and other mobile i9s I've tested still turned in lower scores than this. Out of curiosity, I installed Intel XTU and removed the power limits, leaving only the thermal limits to throttle the CPU. This saw a small bump to 13.3K overall, bringing it in line with the 13th Gen i5 and the new Core Ultra 5, the former of which was in a chewy with an oversized heatsink, and the latter which has a far more efficient architecture. Geekbench 6 rarely seems to cause power throttling scenarios, so many i7s and i9s traditionally do pretty well here. The multi-core score of 10,394 is only 300 points or so above the last 12900H I tested, and the single core score of 2271 is actually about 90 points lower. Using XTU gains a few points on both benchmark results, enough to notice but perhaps not enough to get excited for. The OpenCL and Vulkan scores are, again, not offering any surprises compared to the same Iris XE units I've tested before, and removing the CPU power limits actually has a small negative effect on graphics performance. What is new to my testing is the Geekbench ML test. This benchmark covers AI and machine learning type workloads, and as it's a new test to my videos, I don't have a lot of comparative data yet. The only CPU I've tested so far is the new Ultra 5 125H, which benefits from having a neural processing unit built in. Or apparently it does. That doesn't really show in the CPU results, and Geekbench ML doesn't have a module for NPU testing. The CPU tests are virtually identical, Perhaps that's unfair, as the 125H is a lower mid-range chip in the new lineup, whereas the 12900H was a flagship CPU when it first released. The integrated graphics of this i9 fall quite a way behind the new chip, however, with the 125H's Arc graphics beating the Iris Xe's by about 30%. The 3D Mark results also go pretty much as you'd expect. The i9 gives great CPU performance, within 10% of the best I've ever tested, in fact, but the overall scores in both Time Spy and Firestrike are so heavily weighted in favour of graphics performance that it simply doesn't matter. Both are middle of the pack results, which fall a long way behind the new Ultra 5 chip, and although I haven't tested an Ultra 7 yet, I imagine it's going to blow everything away. If you watched my last mini PC review, you'll know that I've redone my test criteria for DaVinci Resolve, so the test slate has been wiped clean and the results should be a little more realistic now. As usual, I've tested in both H.264 and H.265 rendering using the free version of Resolve, which means the H.264 render is a CPU test, while H.265 stresses the GPU. The difference is I now use a fixed 30 megabit output on both renders, which makes CPU render times far more palatable, but again means I don't have a table of results to compare to. The H.264 render completed in 12 minutes 47 seconds, over 3.5 minutes slower than the new Ultra 5, but still far more realistic than some of the higher bitrate CPU renders I've seen in the past. The H.265 render was still faster, and at just under 8 minutes it's over 2.5 minutes slower than the ARC graphics in the 125H. Plus, this CPU's Iris Xe graphics don't allow for AV1 encoding, which is pretty much the nail in the coffin for me. If you want a video editing mini PC, particularly for 4K, you should get one with a newer CPU than this. The result is less clear-cut in Blender, however. The NAB9 keeps the 12900H trucking along very consistently, completing the classroom test in just under 8 minutes. This isn't the fastest result from this class of chips, but most of the faster scores come from CPUs that had their TDP limit disabled. Doing the same to the NAB9 shaves more than a minute off that render time, and at under 7 minutes, the 12900H is now in AMD territory. Not current gen AMD territory, but still better than I'd come to expect from Intel. If you've seen my previous review of the Geekom X-T12 Pro, which also had a 12900H, 
none of the gaming results are going to shock you. If you haven't, then whether you're shocked or not depends on whether you thought this was going to be some kind of gaming monster. Alas, on its own, it isn't. The integrated graphics can't drive a 1080p 60 experience in Apex Legends, though at 900p it can manage an acceptable 72 FPS with lows in the 50s. Battlebit Remastered is a real lesson for the gaming industry. Only the very weakest iGPUs fail to reach a constant 60 FPS in this graphically simple game, even at 1080p thanks to the potato quality presets. The NAB9 can stay well above 60 FPS pretty much all the time at these settings, with an average breaking past 100. Counter-Strike 2 is a bit tougher. The potential is there in the CPU, but it needs more compromises to be made to get up into the triple digits. I prefer to stick to 1080p where I can, and I find it's possible to have a decent time in deathmatch using the low quality settings at about 70 FPS, but it's not going to be the smoothest, most competitive experience. Fortnite is more of a fort nightmare on Intel chips, even the newest ones. The averages are fine, but the 1% lows are appalling and make the game truly painful to play. It's not something specific to the 12900H either. In my test of the new Core Ultra 5 125H, I had higher averages, but equally terrible lows. I can't help but wonder if the driver development team might have missed this one, or if I simply need to give up on trying to run this game on Intel integrated graphics. Overwatch 2 isn't a bad time on the NAB9 at all. Once the initial stutters have ironed out, you should be able to enjoy a 60fps average with only the occasional frame time spike. If you can tolerate some resolution scaling though, I'd suggest dropping to 75%, as that small drop in image quality can see a near 50% increase in averages and much more enjoyable frame pacing. There are a couple of elephants in the room when talking about this mini PC. First is power consumption. You can't have it both ways, a CPU with more relaxed PL throttling is naturally going to use more power, and at stock settings this is one thirsty chip. Which brings us on to the other elephants, all the alternatives. Firstly, AMD have been making APUs that are mostly superior to Intel's mobile chips for a couple of generations now, but I know some people won't even entertain buying from Team Red. That being said, the new Core Ultra series chips appear to be a nice step up from this in terms of both CPU performance and efficiency, as well as GPU performance. If you compare like for like, this i9 is closest in spec to the Ultra 7 155H, but in my testing so far, even the Ultra 5 beats this i9 in most scenarios. Whereas an Ultra 7 based mini PC would be far more expensive than this NAB9, the Ultra 5 is much closer in price and might be worth the small premium, especially if power consumption and thermals are a concern. If, however, you have a limited budget, an Intel fixation, or maybe you need to buy a hundred of the things, the 12900H is still a very capable chip, and from what I've seen so far, the NAB9 is among the systems most capable of taming it. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.